Welcome to this webinar, Vision to Reality, Digital Leadership in the NHS. I'm Fiona Godley, Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to a webinar brought to you by NHS providers, NHS clinical commissioners, and NHS Confederation. Uh, I, the, the focus of the webinar is the importance of digital leadership in the NHS. New technology is clearly very exciting and has huge opportunities for improving healthcare, uh, the quality of healthcare, the experience of both providing and receiving healthcare in the NHS. But success, I think we'll all agree, depends on people and culture, both of which require leadership. Our Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, has uh, made new technology a real focus of his tenure in office, and we'll be hearing from him shortly. Uh, we also want to hear from you, and uh, we hope you will join us through Twitter. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag digital leadership and also sending questions through the webinar software and also emailing us if that's easier on hello at kaleidoscope healthcare so i'm delighted to have with me a panel of experts who uh, represent key stakeholders across the nhs and in particular in the nhs's digital future so i'm going to just welcome chief executive joe harrison uh, digital uh, development and um, change management um, expert across the national scene in the NHS, Deborah El Sayed, and consultant physician Shanti Vijayaragban. So let me ask um, Joe first of all to introduce himself. Hello, I am the Chief Executive of Milton Keynes University Hospital. I've been there for the last six and a half years and we have an absolute focus on getting this digital agenda as right as we can be. Thanks Joe. Shanti. Um, hello, um, I'm Shanti Vijaragwan and I work as a consultant in diabetes and endocrinology at Newham University Hospital, which is a part of Bath's Health in East London. I've been there since 1996 and I am very keen that we make our outpatient model more fit for purpose um, currently. Great, thanks. I'm Deborah. Hello, I'm Deborah Alside. I'm the Director of Transformation at Bristol North Somerset and South Cross, the CCG, and I'm really passionate about how we embed technology into everything that we do so that we start to build systems that are around the person not around the organizations that we work in great and Deborah so perhaps can I start with you what what do you uh, how would you describe what you're doing in the digital space and also what barriers do you see to us moving forward more more speedily but also more effectively so so I think so for me my journey in digital has been a few years so I've been <laughs> you had trouble uh, describing exactly <laughs> what you do I've and been I, in, well, I've been in the NHS since 91 about 2000, I started to clock that, where digital and innovation um, was, was going to be the future of healthcare. So I kind of followed that path, and I've been incredibly privileged to have uh, about 15 years at a national level doing some amazing things. So PACs, supporting local organisations with things like e-referrals, uh, and more latterly, things like NHS.UK, which is really the patient and public focused side of enabling people and democratising access to health information. And one of the things that's really struck me is that 15 years ago, I wouldn't be sitting with amazing people like you. We've actually managed to mainstream digital as part of what we do. But now the journey is to try and embed it so we don't have separate digital projects, but it's just part so of the way we do things. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I was drawn to working locally and working as a director of transformation to be able to practice some of the things I've been preaching about. So about a year and a half ago, I joined Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucester and I'm the SRO for the digital work stream. Uh, and within a week or so of actually being there, I was asked to try and help sort out our local maternity system. And when I looked into it, that program, which is a cross system program around better births, was kind of stuck. They'd got stuck because digital had become a barrier to them. They wanted to work collaboratively as, as clinicians across three organizations, but the digital piece had gone in the way. So we were able as a system to be able to provide them with the opportunity to have a program of work that comes onto one single system for booking, single templates. And now I'm delighted to be able to report that um, that LMS is a, a national exemplar. Mm -hmm. been, um, we've been commended by Baroness Cumberledge but it's actually about enabling people to be able to deliver what they needed. So it's not really about mm. 
um, being a technologist, it's about enabling all of our teams. And, and what are the what are the barriers to doing that? Because I think we, we would all agree that it is the people, isn't it? And, it and is, absolutely. I think there are myths around digital. You've got to be a technologist to be able to do digital. You've got to have digital in your job title to be a digital leader. Yeah, that confused me. You didn't have it in your job title. No, <laughs> so, so, so I believe yeah, that actually... Be, digital is everything. Digital leadership is leadership. Yeah. Same way as safety, um, our clinical workforce, the things that we're doing for our population, digital is part of everything we do. If you think about our daily lives, we don't pick up our phones and do things and think I'm just going to do some technology, we just interact. Yeah. So I think the key messages for me are about embedding digital, um, are about making sure we skill up our teams and enable them to feel like they have the opportunity to innovate and use digital and do some of that myth busting. And, and also to understand that sometimes when you're trailblazing some of this stuff, it's actually quite exhausting. When you're trying to encourage clinicians who maybe have got a really busy workload and they're not interested um, and they don't necessarily see the value, that we've got to support our teams to be able to be resilient, to be kind, and, and actually make sure that we embed that kind of determination around delivering digitally enabled change as part of everything uh, that we do. And I think the other thing is about making sure that we don't skip the design phase. Because if we don't have our, um, if we don't understand the problem we're trying to solve with digital, there's a danger we're simply implementing things that have worked elsewhere. And there's a whole catalogue of failed projects where we haven't connected with that design, the needs of the users, both the clinicians and the people that we serve, to ensure that when we set up these digital programs of work and invest in them, they're headed off in the right trajectory. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Shanti, your thoughts? Um, More about also what, yes, I mean, you're a doctor in this, in this setting, aren't you? So, yes. So, um, I, I think we'd all agree that the current outpatient model really um, doesn't always meet the needs of patients. Um, and it's a very uh, reactive model rather than a proactive model. Um, and, and, and so what I've been quite keen to do is really look at how we make it more user friendly. Um, and, and so what we've been doing since 2011, my team and uh, our academic partners in Oxford, led by Trish Greenhalgh, is to look at online consultations, um, because we often bring people to an outpatient clinic when they don't physically need to be there. And um, we started off with some funding from the Health Foundation looking at scope and feasibility and then got an NIHR grant to look at online consultations at three levels, so currently the patient clinician dynamics of doing an online mm -hmm. consultation, the organizational impact if everybody was to go ahead and start doing virtual consultations, and the macro level stuff around kind of national policy and tariff and governance and all the sticky stuff. And more recently, we've just got funding from the Health Foundation as part of their scaling up program to look at supporting national teams um, to do um, more non-face-to-face -face care. But, and I'm absolutely fascinated by it because I think what it does is for a change, you actually put the patient at the center of the whole thing. And, mm. and to me, that matters hugely as a clinician as, and as someone who's been a patient and, and how a carer. Do you get the patient input into that? So in fact, it's been really interesting because over the last seven or eight years that we've been doing this, we have worked very, very closely with patients from East London, which is where I work. And I've often been told, um, you know, elderly Bengali women will not use this. And actually, our internet usage in East London and the broadband usage is some of the highest in the country. Mm -hmm. And because people use Skype to keep in touch with family all over the world. So, and what about the general practitioner? Um, you know, that 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 three-way conversation between patient, hospital, and GP. So we uh, most of our work at the moment is within primary, uh, within secondary care. But we have we do a lot of work in the community. And so we are currently working with some other sites around the country, looking at how we can, so that, for example, some of the work we're doing um, in Northumbria is around primary care. Um, Norfolk and Norwich, I mean, you know, they have this huge problem of geography. Their patients travel huge distances mm -hmm. to get to a hospital appointment that they don't necessarily have to do. Um, you know, and so there's this whole issue about, um, you know, the, the distance travels, the environmental impact, and the really interesting that thing that comes out from at the at end of it is patients tell us that there's a fundamental change in the clinician-patient interaction when they don't come visit you in your space and they sit in a cold outpatient room where you run the consultation. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to them in their home, 
it's actually a conversation among equals mm -hmm. and people then feel more uh, empowered to actually ask the difficult questions. And, and what barriers have you found? What I mean, in scaling this up mm. or spreading it more widely, what do you see the barriers? So I think all of what we're talking about, the digital stuff is really great and really exciting, but they're just tools. And I think the, the main problem is the current outpatient pathway. You know, mm. it has to be aligned. You have We have to just revisit, you know, we were just having a chat, but how many people really need to come to clinic? Yeah, you know, yeah. how many people do we see six monthly? Because that's convenient for yeah, me as yeah. a clinician. It's not convenient for the patient. Yeah. So I think the barrier for me is that we're all looking at individual bits of the pathway and we've got a lot of innovation that works, but putting it all Brilliant. together. Joe, tell us some um, your thoughts on and, and describe a bit about the work that you're doing. So Milton Keynes is now seen as one of the one of the exemplar hospitals in, in digital in the NHS. To put that into context, five years ago, we didn't even have Wi-Fi across the site. Mm. So uh, there's that basic building blocks investment that every organization needs mm. to make sure that we can make the best of the technology that's out there. And if you look at what we've been doing at MK over the last few years, the, the first thing is around tech to support clinicians. So can we enable automatic recording of observations, collecting height, weight, all of those in a way that doesn't involve traditionally the very scarce healthcare worker having to inter intervene. That bit of investment is now in, it's working, and what we know is that the outcomes are better and we can monitor them, we can audit so them. So a patient walks in and they step on a pad and their yeah. height and weight yeah, exactly. are <laughs> slightly ominous prospect. It's all done, prospect, it's, all done. But, it's absolutely yeah. all done. And, and not only can we do that, we know that when you put the cuff onto the patient by the bedside, those results automatically get put into the medical record. So there's no transcription errors, you can see when they've been done, when they haven't been done and so on. So, so using tech to support, and, and if you then put that in the context of availability of information, 24-7 hospitals, making sure that people can access that patient information when they need it without having to go into the depths of the medical records department. It's there on screen for every bit of important clinical data for that patient that turns up in A&E or wherever it may be. The second, the second part for us then is how do we genuinely engage our patients in the way that they manage their care and that we support them? What we've been doing at MK is We've developed a patient portal whereby patients can interact with our hospital at a time of their choosing. They can book, they can change their outpatient appointments sitting on their sofa at 10 o'clock at night without having to talk to another human being. It's again what normal people do in their everyday lives mm -hmm. and yet the NHS has persisted with this call us between the hours of nine till five and we'll sort you out. No that's not how it should work. And then moving into saying when you want to contact us we'll send you information electronically so that you don't have to have for any of us out there who are parents or have parents of twins i've got whole lever arch files full of full of paper from various hospitals actually i didn't want that everything i want to store electronically my mum and dad 85 years old they want the paper so let's give those patients the, the choice choices. there um exactly. two quick questions before we move on to mm. our, our video but um uh, barriers to spread spreading this elsewhere but also uh, confidentiality and the issue of, sorry, lots of questions, the issue of patients controlling their own data, which I think is what most of us as patients would like to do. So I'm, I'm very clear that my medical record is exactly that. It's my medical record. I want it on my phone. I want to be able to access it when I want. And interestingly, our Secretary of State agrees with that because we've asked him. So absolutely give me my data. I think the second bit around the governance agenda is actually as long as you are using secure networks, we do banking online, yeah. even the HMRC is online these days. What's interesting is technology is not the barrier to change. The mindset of the individual is the barrier in most instances. And what we've been able to see is that for our outpatients, a portal, 62% of our patients have gone online with no training. And of those 62%, over 90% of them use it routinely. So they're not just registering, they're using it. Over 90% of those mm. patients is staggering. If it's a good product, people will people use, will it. use yes. it. Well, let's hear now from our Secretary of State, Matt Hancock, um, who has given an exclusive interview for this webinar. 
We all believe that speeding up digital transformation across the NHS is really important. What do you think the challenges are that are holding up this process across the NHS at the moment? Well, I think one of the biggest problems is to uh, make sure that we can bring people with us. Ultimately, the technology is the easy bit. The hard bit is the culture change that comes with it um, and the need to bring people with us. I, that Both clinicians, management, uh, all parts of any organisation. I think that's, off, that's nearly always the hardest bit. Um, partly that's because in the rest of our lives, upgrading the technology has become something that we don't really notice because as tech becomes more agile, better reflecting users' needs, you don't really notice when you update your iPhone or whatever it is. Um, but often a change in technology in a hospital is like it used to be 10, 20 years ago when you then have to relearn a load of things and it sucks time. And we need to change that so that the technology better meets people's needs. How can we ensure that there's sufficient investment in digital transformation? Well, this is really important. There's, of course, uh, pots of money which uh, we in the department hold and uh, will allocate to good projects and that's uh, and obviously I recognize that's an important part of it but I don't regard that as the most important technology spend uh, the 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 funding that we allocate and in future will be allocated through NHSX is less important than the investment that each NHS institution each trust invests in its own technology. You know, owning the technology at a board level, at a chief executive level, is critical to getting this right. And you don't need to understand the technology or be able to code in order to uh, do that. You need to care about improving patient quality of service uh, by using the best technology and therefore allocating budget uh, towards it. And ultimately, a huge amount of this technology can save money. I want to make it as easy as possible to, um, uh, to see future savings and bring them in to uh, allocate money this year. Uh, and I hope that with our five-year settlement from next year, there'll be more of that uh, fluidity to be able to spend money that will save over a period. Uh, but the, ultimately, the most important spending on technology is, the, is, is uh, what's done within a trust on their own budget uh, to improve the technology for their people. And how, how should we make the case for more investment in the spending review? We'll make the case through outcomes and improved performance. And uh, that's the argument that we need to make. So you can do this in two different languages. The language of giving more time to clinicians and giving more uh, a bet a better outcomes for patients that's the language that we should be using to the clinicians and the patients. The language to Treasury is we can make your money go further if we make investment in this space. It can be a real concern for both clinicians and patients that technology creates barriers rather than brings them together. How can you reassure people that this won't be the case? Well, we can, we can only reassure patients that uh, technology improves their relationship with their clinicians by making that so. You know, the truth here is that you've got to get the technology to work for the users. You can't, you can't uh, gild the lily. You can't pretend that it does if it doesn't. If you need 30 logins, no wonder people are frustrated with the technology. If it takes you 10 minutes to log on when you're busy or you have a, uh, a sick patient in front of you, of course people are furious. These are the things that we need to fix. How can we quickly address the huge variation in digital preparedness that exists both across communities and across the country? Well, I want to see a, a rapid take up within the NHS. I want to see uh, CIOs or CCIOs on board so that every NHS organisation sees technology as absolutely core to how it runs the organisation. Uh, we then need to make sure also that patients who want to use uh, technology can, but we need to recognise that not everybody's able to. And I suppose um, whether that's because they have a, they don't want to, or whether their broadband isn't good enough, uh, in a in a way, the reason that people can't use the technology is less important than the fact that the use of technology needs to free up time and resources for people who 
can't use it. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and that's the approach that we need to take. In a way, um, the, uh, the, my focus is on making sure that absolutely at its core, the technological changes we make, the changes to the technology, the mandated improved standards of interoperability and cybersecurity and data, and data protection, which are vital, um, and the better technology, especially in hospitals and across uh, primary and community care, the thing I really, really want to see out of that is to be clinicians given back time so that they can do the things that only they can do. And that has to be at the core of it because ultimately I care about technology because I care about people and people getting a better service from the NHS. Well, thank you very much, Matt Hancock. Um, very fascinating that. I mean, I think it's great to have the drive from the government in this way, yeah. but I don't know about you, and I'll be asking for your reflections on what you've just heard. It struck me he was saying two slightly contradictory things there. He began by saying technology is the easy bit. Uh, so I'm thinking, why have we found it so hard? Um, he says we need to bring people along. But then he talked a lot about the fact that technology just wasn't good enough, that it needs to be better to, to meet people's needs. So it seems to me Technology isn't the bit we we haven't got that right either, yeah. and we haven't got the people bit or the technology mm. right. I mean, Joe, what do you think? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, no, no, no. I mean, he starts off by saying we needed to bring everybody with us, and uh, for want of shortening my career, I don't agree with him. Um, I think what we do need is a critical mass of people engaged in this agenda so that we deliver a momentum that is unstoppable. There will always be the individual, the group that thinks that paper is the future when the rest of the world has moved into email. And so how do we ensure as an NHS we can evidence the benefits of the solutions that we're coming up with, both from that freeing up time, which he's absolutely right on, and from that patient engagement and involvement. I just worry that we are trying to make sure that everybody in a in a system is signed up to doing this. And if we wait for that, we'll be waiting forever. Shanti, your thoughts? And there's a mm. question here also from Deborah Needham about <laughs> yeah. how do we get clinicians to embrace this for outpatients? Okay, so um, shall I do the reflections yeah, do the first, reflections first and then yeah. question later? So yes, I mean, I, 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 I was quite pleased that he recognised that there's a huge variation in technology across the NHS. So, you know, there are some bits like probably Milton Keynes, that brilliant. I'm still using a clip-on webcam and we still have Internet Explorer, so a lot of the new software is not available on it. So, you know, um, so there is a variation in technology. Um, I like the fact that he recognizes that one size will not fit all and there will be people who will not want to have um, uh, uh, online care and they will not want to get electronic uh, uh, messages and they will want the paper copy and they will want to turn up for their appointments and we must recognize that and we mustn't have um, a difference in the way we provide care for different groups. And I, I, I was pleased that he recognized that. And, I, and giving clinicians back time was music to my ears. But do you think that is a reasonable uh, out, but, out It is, but it's very, very difficult to deliver at the moment because what we are doing, um, thanks to rolling out technology, not very effectively, is we having a duplication of systems. So I will do a Skype consultation and at the end of it, I will type my letter and then I, because the patient hasn't turned up, I put the blood test form in an envelope and go down and mail it. So we haven't got to the stage where we're actually, we're at this cusp where mm. Actually, We're, it's possibly more work for the doctor. Exactly. And that leads very nicely to, to this question from Deborah Needham. And I think that is the problem. It's the clinician's mindset. And I can say that as a clinician, because that was me eight years ago. I couldn't text. And I was asked to do a little pilot by NHS Choices using online care. And I just thought it wouldn't work. And I was surprised when everybody loved it. And as part of the scaling up work, when we work with national teams, one of the barriers, which I didn't mention at the beginning, is the, the, the clinician mindset. I mean, I love sitting in clinic and chatting to my patients. I can do that all day. But it doesn't occur to me that that's a mum who's got one kid in school, who's rushing down doing the school run, sorting things out, and has to get out of there in time to pick the second one up. Mm -hmm. And I can sit there and talk to her forever after having kept her waiting for 45 minutes anyway in the mm -hmm. first place. So. 
I think the problem is the clinician mindset. And I think I find what works is we've collected loads of videos and patient stories and patient feedback from focus groups. And that is very, very powerful for a clinician mm -hmm. to play a film or to play a video. Or of what's happening for the patient. Yeah. What's happening yeah. for the patient yeah. gets me to change also, my I mind. I guess, I mean, the point that Matt Hancock's making is, is he would like it to be easy for doctors. So it's kind of getting over the barrier where currently it's not easy for doctors to engage with the technology because maybe the technology isn't good enough. I mean, Deborah, in your, your reflections on what Matt Hancock said, have, we haven't got the technology right either. We haven't, but I think one of the things that I hear is that agency, that agency to have ambition, which picks up some of the things that Joe was talking about earlier. And I'm kind of reflecting on, we're doing a lot of our mental health at the moment, and the whole parity of esteem around mental and physical health has been a really big thing in the NHS. And actually it just struck me listening to that, that there's a thing about parity of digital experience for both our clinicians and for the people that we serve, both in and out of our lives, our wider lives in the NHS. So I think that's a really powerful ambition to give us agency to do that. And this piece about the time for clinicians, because that is our business. Our business is supporting health and care, enabling people to um, support themselves where needed, that left shift of keeping them out of hospital mm -hmm. when they don't need to be there. But there's something about that ambition to collect the data we need to understand the outcomes as a byproduct of delivering care, rather than, you know, Shanti's experience of, I do my bit clinically and then I print off a piece of paper. <laughs> so actually, I think I think the call to action for us is to encourage us to be ambitious and to, th to be ambitious and to think about these things, uh, and not to say people aren't being ambitious. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I've heard people talking about, well, I've got an idea, but maybe it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. But it's absolutely we need to get our workforce thinking about all of this because the solutions lie deep in our organisations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are things that people want to do that I think we can give them permission and support them to get those things done. So Michael Lum has, has asked, why is it more effort not put? Why is more effort not put into developing excellent user interfaces for patients and staff? So style and design. It's that point about you know none of us question picking up our iPhone because it's just such a beautiful object and it mm. does what we want it to do. So where does that style and design piece come in? Uh, that's about so they, they talk about user experience. So the reason that. Apple and those apps that we all choose to gravitate to are so amazing is because they've really invested time in understanding what makes people tick, how many button clicks, the, the information they're trying to get to. So if you think really old school, that ethnographic research, what makes the doctor tucked? What makes them have to walk across the room? So going back to some of that old school design um, process to really deeply understand not just what people tell you what they need, but what they actually need to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need somebody who's standing back. So we do need to invest in helping our teams to understand the whole design principle. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole raft mm -hmm. of life out there that helps us understand some great ways to do it. But UX has not been, user experience has not been kind of right yeah. there at the... Uh, uh, so we're both big on that the BMJ, may I say. We've, we've become very, very I know, we've, um, we've been much more educated mm. about the need for UX. And but Joe, I was just going to ask you, um, the, the point that was making about yeah. investment, that yeah. struck me that Matt Hancock was kind of passing the buck slightly. He was saying, you know, NHSX will do some of that, but it's really down to the individual um, institution level at the board level to mm -hmm. do this. What, what's your view on that? So organisations are always going to be faced with a choice between replacing the broken bit of clinical equipment and do they invest in fixing the hole in the roof versus technology and it is one of those situations where there is never enough money to go around mm. a decent technology business case will support itself we spend an absolute fortune in the NHS on staff on doing things that can be better done by using different technological solutions so getting that bit front and center for me is really really important I think the other the other interesting thing that the NHS tends to tends to do is um, it will it will say right we need a we need a chief information officer on the board or a chief clinical information officer on the board. I, As you were shaking your head when he said I, that, I, I just <laughs> think it's one of those it's one of those situations whereby if you have a board in the current environment who where there is a clinical issue it will be and and the only person that answers that question is the medical director. We're, we've got a board that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Actually, everybody on the board, whether it's executive or non-executive, should be in the position whereby they understand 
where the organisation is going strategically mm -hmm. with this agenda. But I mean, that I guess mean, needs training, doesn't it? I mean, he, Matt Hancock no, said. No, well, he said he said something about he said something about you don't need to know how the technology exactly. works to promote it. But I think you, I mean, here's me speaking. I would imagine. I mean, I'm on a board, and I and I. I have to understand enough of what's going on to be able to contribute to that conversation. So they, they surely need to be, they need to raise their game in some way, but otherwise why aren't we getting it right now? So so we have experts in governance, we have experts in technology that can advise boards, there's no question mm -hmm. about that. Do I, I'm one of the most Luddite chief execs in certain technological terms, and yet we talk about user interface and experience. The, the work that we've done at MK, not a single patient has been trained. Mm. They're picking it up and they're using it because it was developed with patients. Mm. And it, so, as an NHS, how do we, how do we use the use the ideas and the exp, the excitement of the of the sixteen year old technological genius in their bedroom to come up with the innovation that we blend with the patient and with the organisation that is the NHS to come up with user products? That's where we've got to get to. Not having a CIO on the board. Some of the of this saving may come and there's a question here from mm. Emily Kiddy about about actually making certain roles obsolete. Mm. Shanti, what do you feel about that? Well actually that's a that's quite interesting because I, I find what happens is a lot of staff in the NHS are doing bits and pieces of everything and often not very well because we're all rushed for time. And a classic example is in my clinic. Um, the clinic nurse is absolutely brilliant. He's been there for a very, very long time. He's won loads of awards, but he was spending, spending a lot of time meeting and greeting patients, um, you know, weighing them, doing their height and weight, checking that they'd had all their test results. Um, a lot of people with diabetes have waited so long to be seen by me that they get low blood sugar or hypoglycemia waiting in the waiting area. So he was making them cups of tea and giving them glucose. Of course, because we're doing a lot of it online, when, and a lot of the time, patients initiate the contact. So a bit of his time has been freed up, but it hasn't made him obsolete. What it's actually done is developed his role into a very strong clinical role. So it's taken all the admin and the peripheral stuff out, and he's now pretty much running a clinical service there, which is what he's trained to do, which is what he's doing very well. But I guess if, 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 if uh, Deborah, perhaps a question, if we're going to save money, the one of the things is save money, save time, we will have to lose roles, won't we? We'll have to lose, we want to have fewer people working in the NHS. If we well, well I, I think, isn't there something also about, and I think this, this comes into Emily's question, is that if we start to understand what's going on across the system, because at the moment we struggle sometimes to understand exactly what's going on in some of these mm -hmm. complex organisations that we've got. So it's about understanding that thread of value. What are the things that we need to do that will actually add value to people's lives, to their clinical outcomes? And that's why the data is so important and to bring some of that data together to be able to understand it, which doesn't necessarily mean we automatically leap to roles being obsolete, but it enables us to do some things very differently to be able to deliver, I mean, we're all trying to sustain the free at point of need NHS. That's what we're all here to do collectively. And the more we understand what's going on and where we're expending a lot of energy and effort and money potentially, and maybe not actually adding value to, to the individual, that's where that technology will help us collect the right data, the technology will help us bring that data together. Things like AI and genomics will help us understand more to be able to do that left shift or the temporal shift of interacting earlier. And I think that's the bit that actually really helps us think about how we take that next leap from you know, 1948 and an Iron Bevan's vision into what's our vision from 2019 beyond mm. to do some of these things. So I think it's, it's important we think about it enables us mm. to do things differently, not lose things. Mm. What about that, I, I was, I, I, And I think there's, a, there's an and there in that we are operating with limited resource yeah. and so actually if we can use the money that we have in a more effective way to treat our patients why on earth wouldn't we yeah. it's not that there aren't enough jobs to do in the NHS mm -hmm. there there's more than enough to do it might be that the individual that is currently spending half of their day stuffing envelopes to send letters out to patients can be better employed at the front of the hospital looking after meeting and greeting those individuals that need to come to hospital there's there's always more to do and it's how we how we distribute that yeah, accordingly absolutely. just a note of caution i mean it, it's how we calculate time and I, so one of the headlines from paper that trish and i and 
that's published was picked up by everybody because we said that an average online consultation was nine minutes, but a face-to-face -face was 20 minutes, and everybody thought, you pay, here's the cash saving. But we must recognize that there's nine minutes of patient-facing time online, but there's a lot that happens before and after in clinical time, in systems time, and so on, and that needs to be factored in. So we must be a little bit careful when we're calculating roles and technology and savings because it's great in terms of user experience and it's great in terms of using that time effectively but there's a lot that happens around it that okay, we must make sure point. that we don't forget about yeah. Yeah. it's the, it, i was just going to yeah, say yeah. It's, it, it's it's the um, electronic patient mm -hmm. record business case that adds up all of the 15 seconds of a nurse writing in the notes and saying you don't need to do mm -hmm. that anymore because the cuff automatically does it and coming up with a half a million pounds saving in nursing time. It doesn't happen, mm. it's not real. So, so actually Louise Dimpton's asking, um, if funding is the barrier, um, and we've just had this extra money for the NHS, how can we prioritise the digital side? Matt Hancock talked about, we've got to have these two conversations, one with the Treasury, which is about time and money, isn't it, really? And the other with the clinicians and patients, which is about quality of care, patient safety. Um, you, you, I, I do agree we have to have both of those, and. and yeah, as you say, we can't just add up tiny pieces of people and we want to improve the quality of the service, don't we, Jim? And, and, and the golden thread throughout that is the workforce. And Matt is absolutely right there about how do we invest in technology, in our estate and in our people to make sure that the very scarce resource that we have our workforce mm. is, is appropriately supported mm. because we know people are under increasing pressure. Mm. And we know that individuals, mm. as you say, Shanti, are, are carrying out roles that could and in other industries have been replaced mm -hmm. by the use of technology. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, it connects on to Barbara's question, if I may, yeah. um, who's asked about how we connect up parts of the NHS, the community and acute care in a loop. So we've got those, those agencies. I'd kind of loop those two questions yes. together mm -hmm. because, you know, so there are a number of areas around the country who've been identified as exemplars around um, sharing records across much larger footprint. So let me do, let's just tell people what Barbara's question is. Barbara Sorry. Russians, no, don't worry, Barbara Russians asked about how we can connect together so that there's a single electronic patient record that primary and secondary care and all the different parts of the system would use, including, I guess, the patient, ideally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and these local shared record programmes, like Chris, I didn't make the acronym up, um, <laughs> uh, are about doing that in line with where we've got tertiary flows, where we've got connections, where we know that actually what's yeah. happening is our clinicians are working without that information and our patients are going to places expecting things to be connected up and they're not and that equals inefficiency clinical risk and and, and just not the way we want to do business mm -hmm. so I think it is about linking those things up and it's hard as I said earlier on getting people to think outside their organizational um, uh, environment is really difficult and as an STP and I'm sure many across the country as aspirant ICSs or actual ICSs are doing the same thing is how do we invest in that partnership approach so that rather than solving only our own problems internally we are thinking about how do we do this much more um, on a system and a partnership level so investing in the technology that will help us achieve some of those ambitions and you know we're, we're at the early stages we've invested in the partnership piece I'm not suggesting we've got a magic um, bullet to this, but it is about that. And Matt Hancock's point, it's about the people. Mm -hmm. It's about us coming together with that shared ambition. So this point about user experience, UX, mm -hmm. Joe, are you using that? And are you bringing in GPs and to get to get this sort of single piece? I mean, there's a risk, isn't there, that we think of it, we, we go back to the days of NHS, um, what was it called? Um, MPFIT. MPFIT, um, which was this huge technological transformation that was supposed to completely change everything. And, fast cost and and it didn't do that um and so then the other side is to do these much more modular smaller scale things and, and matt's even expect saying you know at each institutional level mm -hmm. um but i guess uh i suppose my question is twofold one is how do we make sure we're bringing everyone into that mm -hmm. conversation so the gps the patients the hospital docs the nurses the administrative staff mm -hmm. um and and also how do we then you know do we want to do this in small scale pilots which we then spread out or do we think of it as much more nhs wide initiative so absolutely the the local health and care record exemplars in terms of the the nhs and social care working together to get a single patient record mm -hmm. completely agree with that and it needs to be done on a scale that does engage mm -hmm. so we we talk about pilots in the nhs the clarity for me is and, and it comes back to one of the earlier questions is if we have something that works get it out there 
don't keep holding on to it as a pilot get it out and that for me is where the center is really really and is value. this the role for nhsx because well, exactly. we had a question from emily exactly. Lios, yeah. saying mm. what what yeah. what is needed is nhsx to support and invest and then scale up yeah. is that your yeah. sense that, that, that's exactly mm. it. there are organizations it's not just it's mm. not just it's not what we see at Barnsley. It's, mm. it, there are organisations across the country mm. that are doing brilliant things. And what we see is other parts of the country who aren't able to learn, aren't able to pick those up and implement them. And for me, NHSX is about mm. spreading good practice. That's where that's where they come in. Shanti, NHSX? Yeah, I right? absolutely agree. And and there's something about skilling but, but What happened to NHS Digital, by the way? Do we mind? Do we have to... Do, 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 Sorry, I'll come to that. Maybe, maybe Deborah can answer. But no, but I was also saying there's something there about not just spreading good practice, but skilling staff. Yeah. Because, um, you know, most of us are. I don't have any formal training in anything apart. I mean, as a clinician, yes, I, I can treat people with diabetes and endocrine problems, but no one's ever taught me anything about, you know, service redesign or um, sustaining innovation or anything like. That. So there's a bit about skilling staff across mm -hmm. the organisation at various grades as well and maybe that's a role for NHSX too. Okay, thank yeah. you. Good so, 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 so my thing about NHSX is where are we going to invest in a hub of global level experts around design who've done some of this in other industries, who've got some of those mindsets. The thing we need to do is to make sure that we help those people who could, you know, very easily get isolated to connect into some of the local problems that we're trying to solve. Some of the things that we, we all articulate, mm. be it outpatients, be it um, read write access across our systems be it integrated care agendas so we share some of those problems it's about helping those new people coming into that organization and forming it to help them connect so I think we've also got to be quite welcoming yeah. as well as pointing the finger at what people need to do to say we want you to come and help we want to offer you some insights into the really important problems that we're trying to address that we can work in a symbiotic way together with the center to be able to deliver that mm. We've got a specific question from Jill Rasmussen about um, how can technology help us or help patients and doctors who have sensory, auditory or other, mm. you know, learning intellectual disabilities. Is that, a, is that a big piece of what we should expect from it, Shanti? It, it is an issue. We've had some focus groups specifically around this with people <laughs> and there is a concern about people with visual problems. So, you know, when we, we'd look, we, we found about 62% acceptance, for example, for online care and of, of the remaining 40, 20 percent were people who we thought medically couldn't cope with this. So that is something that one needs to consider. Um, and, and I'm sure there is, I mean, you know, just things like translation for non-English speakers. Yes. It's a big deal when you're trying to do something online. So again, I don't want to keep putting everything into NHSX's basket, but maybe there's something there about looking at um, how best do we um, modify technology make it easier to use um, and again there might be examples around the country where people have done this and whether we could learn from other other industry and I think you, that Deborah. piece about learning from places in the country, I think there's a, a really important connection with our academic communities. Mm. So in Bristol, we're really fortunate. We've got a robotics lab. We've got really like lots of the country, some of these smart homes that are all wired mm. up. I mean, Alexa has transformed mm. the lives of people with visual mm. um, and intellectual disabilities. So that it's actually enabled people mm. to be much more independent uh, and using that technology, as well as, as we're all aging, which is something to be celebrated, living longer, we need to think about where people are starting to experience cognitive decline. As Joe was saying, it's that health and care connection that we start to think about how can we have smart homes that connect to our clinicians mm. and enable people to live more independent lives. So I think there's a really big opportunity with technology to help bridge some of the gaps that we've struggled with mm. previously. Mm. And I, we, we've started a project at Milton Keynes about um, how we support and engage and we, we, we talk about the differently abled. Mm. Okay, this is not about pigeonholing okay, sure. people as, as, as having a disability because a lot of people have different abilities that we can connect into as a health and care system and how do we use technology to enable us to do that and again I, I come back to it's not the technology that prevents this from happening the technological solutions are out there it's about how we as health and care professionals implement those with mm. our patients to get the best mm. There's all this the movement, which I'm sure you'll be aware of from patients. Um, we are not waiting, hashtag we are not waiting, which is patients, um, you know, impatient for, for change, impatient. Um, and, and, you know, technologically advanced, many of them in their own lives, uh, pushing for innovation um, 
while, while the health system the health systems around the world are not delivering um i mean to something i think it seems to me that's something we should absolutely embrace and that the idea of sort of saying no you can't do this yeah. stop hacking into your into your mm. insulin pump because mm. you know that's not your you're not allowed to do that um in order to deliver the, the the type of service you want how how can we better engage patients i'm very conscious of the fact um that we don't have a patient on this panel which i think uh, another um, time this happens it'd be great to have that but how can we really i mean um what's the word harvest the the expertise of patients uh to, to really get a better result deborah what's your feeling about that? so i think if you look at this a maker community which is some of those there's, there's parents of um, children with type 1 diabetes who are making their own apps and capabilities to be able to support um, their families there are is a, a a guy called um uh, oh golly, I've forgotten his first name. Uh, Michael Serez, who has globally now transformed um, the ability for, for stoma care to be changed by people who experience it. So I think there are already communities out there. I think some of the things that places like um, the London um, Accelerator, the NHS Accelerator that Simon Stevens has set up, and the academic health science networks are starting to bring those technologies into um, our line of sight. So I think it's also really important for local organizations to engage with that academic connections because they are creating the opportunities for people to come uh, and to share what they're doing and also to help them build it. So those innovation Absolutely. accelerators Absolutely. are not just about come with your finished product, mm. they're about saying, what's your idea? Let's help you in the same way as we do it with other parts of industry. And those are really important connection points. And they'll only succeed if we in the NHS connect with them. Mm. Thank you. I, I also think patients bring a very important perspective to the whole mm. thing. So, you know, we started off using I will not name a specific bit of software uh, because it ticked all the governance boxes. And then um, every time I explained to somebody about how to use it, I kept saying, oh, it's a bit like Skype. And then they said, well, why can't you just use Skype? <laughs> and then I said, oh, because our governance people wouldn't allow it. And then we did three years of work before we got it accepted and it's, and it's used and, and so on. But it's very, very useful to actually run the ideas but you know apart from all the stuff that's happening nationally and you know diabetes is full of user groups who've done amazing stuff it's really important to take however silly an idea it is and just run it past a patient focus group or ask mm -hmm. the first few people to come to your clinic because you could be quite surprised by how much common sense people bring to the whole thing and you know mm -hmm. we are worried about governance mm -hmm. and if you actually ask the person at the other end they think they're just making a big fuss about something that matters very little to them yes yes so, so uh, information governance quite often gets blamed as the as the <laughs> name as Wakeman, the naysayer Craig Wakeman was asked about information uh, governance and i think the, the question that we've asked a lot in in our hospital is is the technology that we're looking to implement a step in the right direction so can i sit here and say that our uh, our electronic systems will never be hacked. No, of course I can't. What I can absolutely say is that I've got no evidence at all that the letter that we send to the patient actually gets to oh, that absolutely. patient yeah. because there's no audit trail at all. Mm. So if somebody says to me, is email a safer connection to the patient than a letter? At the moment, absolutely yes, and there's an audit trail. Mm -hmm. So I, we, we have a responsibility when dealing with patient information to ensure that it is as secure as we can possibly make it. The, the question for me is how do we get information governance alongside us, alongside the current systems that we are using so that we can test whether it's a step forward or a step back, and then, as Shanti has said, make sure that the patient is at that design stage so that they can say, actually, I want a red button for that, and I want a yellow button for that, and a green button for that. And that ownership is there right from the word go. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 this is a, a webinar about leadership. And um, we've got a question there from um, James, James Johnson about uh, how do you engage staff in the use and transformation of technology in the workplace to enhance delivery? And, and we also have one from um, Julie Mansfield about how to avoid duplication. Where's the guidance and vision from the centre? Those both seem to me to be questions about leadership. Um, and you three in your own roles and those people listening will know how very difficult it is to, to you know, how much top down, how much bottom up? How do you, how do you manage upwards to your, your own bosses, if you like, in the NHS? So perhaps a few reflections from each of you about 
those those really tricky challenges about about um, top down bottom up uh, and also we'll get onto that question about which I think is going to be the ultimate thing is how do we engage the staff Deborah mm -hmm. so so I think the really tricky challenge is acknowledging that it is one and you've got to invest time in it so I did a few turnarounds where PAS deployments so the big systems that support acutes had gone very wrong um, and almost every single one of them without fail it was because that question that James has asked wasn't addressed you know there were acute trusts are very big organizations 12,000 10,000 people so actually engaging people in that transformation and helping them understand why what what's going to happen what difference does it make to me and actually you do need a mindset not of a project management tick box but you need to have a mindset of actually listening and understanding so I think the, the ability to engage staff in that transformation also comes from um, connecting with the problems that they experience on a daily basis I think I think we've all kind of made this point which is when people see there is a better way and there is something that if they connect with and they invest additional energy and effort into it will transform and they feel confident that it's likely to create those changes they are more willing to engage and you know what it's hard sometimes to engage people when you are bored saying something and you think you've over communicated it people are just starting to listen so that's the you know the really kind of age-old engage 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 communicate communicate and our QI academies I think are really starting to in organizations becoming you know that bronze silver gold or however um, other organizations are developing it is really critical because you're then using that kind of the entirety of the workforce and not relying on one project manager to go out and make sure that they've engaged 12,000 people when you start to get at a system level one person to engage 45,000 people or more it starts to become more difficult so that's why we need to use those mechanisms to engage all layers of the organization and make it part of everybody's role I think I think you start off with recognizing it is very very difficult at the moment because you know digital um, uh, leadership and uh, embedding digital technology is just one part I mean staff are facing conflicting priorities at the moment and you know organizations are really stretched and you know and everybody's in the NHS because you you care about patients you care about the local population but I think the first step is recognizing mm. that the environment is tough and morale is low and staff are really really rushed uh, and busy and there is something there about saying yes we know it's tricky and recognizing it because often it feels to ver people very low down and front line that there are things coming constantly and nobody recognizes how hard I'm having to work and how futile the whole thing is so there's a little bit about hearing staff's concern and recognizing the difficult working environment having said that this I come back to what I said at the beginning is looking at the whole system because if if you were to say to someone look if you did this and it's going to be really really tough now but if you've got this bit right then that bit will sort out and then you know that bit that you really really hated and that frustrates you this might be one way of, of, of avoiding that um, then it might start making sense but then what we do very badly is just have silo working and everybody's beavering away with one bit of the system and then you think well why am I doing this if I am not going to benefit it's going to benefit the other person down the line I mean it's not me so there's something about pulling it all together as well I think mm -hmm. so uh, from my perspective allowing people to fail and understanding what lessons can be learned from that and supporting people to move on to the next project is is really important we've got a secretary of state who has said it digital is one of his top three agendas that is fantastic let's let's use that let's mm. build on that to get the nhs to where it needs to be in the 21st century i said earlier i i didn't want a cio on the board or ccio i want everybody on the board to have information clinical information as their responsibility. This is not about exclusion, it's about ensuring that everybody knows that the NHS won't survive unless we use both our workforce in the most appropriate way and support it with the digital agendas mm. that we've got. Uh, we had a question earlier on from James Fitzpatrick about um, how would we measure success of the work to advance digital leadership? So that's that's a, a, specifically the leadership question. How will we measure whether we've got the digital leadership right? Deborah, what do you think? Well, I think there's something really interesting in what Joe's saying, which is it's really easy to, me to measure um, 
have you got a CIO or a CCIO on your board? Or anything? <laughs> that's, that's really easy. It doesn't actually mean it's pervasively embedded across the organisation. Mm -hmm. So, so I think we need to, um, and we need to think about digital leaders at all levels. Mm, exactly. So, uh, you know, mm. uh, looking at the effectiveness of the leadership is actually played through in the outcomes that we see. So, rather than measuring the inputs, why don't we apply the same thing and actually look at how has digital helped to transform experiences of our clinicians so you know we have the kind of the proms prems and croms mm -hmm. um let's Just tell people what they are we'll sorry and patient, reported really outcome measures, patient reported outcome measures patient reported experience measures no and, proms. and clinical reported oh, outcome oh, measures good. so if how about this is an idea why don't we look at some of those approaches to see if there's anything in terms of digital that we can translate into those proms, prems and croms and actually start measuring something that we all believe is meaningful rather than the tick box of the, in, the, the, the input. Thank you. Shanti. I, I mean, little more. I, I, I think it's not easy to measure digital leadership. I start off, I'm, I'm being very negative about it all, but <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think it's not realistic. E I, think. I think it's not easy. But I think coming back to what you said, the fact that people have at least thought about it and, uh, and, and, and giving people the flexibility and the freedom to fail, but having tried something. Currently, we are a very risk averse mm. culture and we don't want to encourage good ideas uh, or, or, or something um, you know, that hasn't been tried before, despite academic evaluation and despite working mm. across systems, because one's worried about sustainability and failure but giving free people the freedom to try and fail for me could be a marker of success. Very good. Thank you, Joe. We stopped talking about digital. <laughs> that would be my definition. Yes. So we stopped. It's like we used to have the word E before everything, didn't mm. we? Exactly. But actually, stopped. it is just now the, the air we breathe. It's absolutely right. I, uh, a colleague of mine said to me a little while ago, well, actually, when we went through electrification, which as you could argue is the same as digitalization or digitization, yeah. is that actually we don't have directors of electricity anymore. So actually, I we we'll probably do, but, <laughs> but they don't have that job title no, anymore job because title. it's just embedded yeah. exactly. in everything that exactly. we do. Just, just to, to finish, can I ask each of you, what, what would you most like to see? What would you most hope for in the next two years? I mean, any, any Secretary of State has a, has a, Matt Hancock would like to hear this, um, a quite a short um, time in tenure, and he wants to deliver this as one of his key priorities. And I, I guess we'd all like to help that happen. Um, with, with whatever one might have, you know, some, some concerns about the specifics. What, what, would, what would you like to see happen in the next two years, Chair? I'd like to see the pace of innovation and implementation increase so people taking risks to do things i'd like to see those products that are successful taken up by the center and rolled out across the nhs and i wouldn't like to see a single solution trying to be placed across the nhs enable health and care systems to test out three or four that have mm. been proven to be successful and run which, with whichever one they like. So choice within a framework for me. Excellent, thanks Shanti. So um, I think it's important that we offer people flexibility because one size will not fit all and just because we all believe firmly that um, digital transformation is key, there will be, you, you can't examine people online. People do need to turn up to a clinic from time to time. And you know there will always be people um, who don't want to do that. And when we've done some research, people have said that they prefer a previous relationship with a clinician before they will want to virtual care. So there will be groups of people, there will be conditions, and there needs to be flexibility within the system. We need a mature way of funding. There's huge of funding our patient care. There's huge disincentives within the system at the moment, and sometimes it's just easier and financially um, better to do a lot of uh, procedures, to bring a lot of people, because there aren't very mature systems for funding virtual care, for example. So somebody needs to look at the whole um, tariff as, a, as a, an, an entirety, I think. Thank you. Deborah. I'd love to see these green shoots that we've been talking about today. You know, this, this kind of parity of digital experience for, you know, from, from life to our work in the NHS and what we do for the populations that we serve. I'd like to see some of that really coming to fruition and things like, you know, 
the user experience for everybody, being an embedded part of the things that we talk about. Uh, and some of the things that we've got ambitions around that are projects that are real, that we've taken them forward and we've demonstrated that they've actually made a difference um, to sustaining the NHS and the people that we serve. So nothing big or anything like that. <laughs> Thank, you very much. Thank you very much to our panel, to Joe Harrison, to Shanti Bigaravan and Deborah El Sayed. Thank you to you all for listening and for the questions. There, there were more questions than we could uh, handle or manage um, during this time, but they will be reviewed and, and find a way to take those on board. Uh, the video will be emailed to you all and also available on NHS providers website. And do please continue your contributions via Twitter, hashtag digital leadership. Thank you very much for joining and best of luck with your own digital leadership programs. Thank you.